Good evening. So indeed, something is happening in the world of education, and I know we are supposed to talk about the future, but I'm going to go to the past and think about where education comes from. So at the root of education is actually something called the Socratic method. In the Socratic method, Socrates talks to his disciples and to his students, argues and dialogues, and uh, that's a method. However, his favorite disciple, Plato himself, brought down the dialogues into books, okay, which was a violation of the principle, and the rest is history. All right, so what do you do with books? Well, you want to diffuse books so that knowledge diffuses into the world. So the method for about almost two millennia was to copying books one at a time. And you see this on the left side here. And it, the result is beautiful. It's a little bit slow. You need a lot of monks to actually achieve the goal. Um, so fortunately, uh, Gutenberg reinvented the printing press, and that made it much easier to actually diffuse books. So technology actually helped knowledge to diffuse in the world. All right. Now, what sort of knowledge? So uh, the what is printed is actually more important than how it is printed. Or shortly, we say, content is king. Or another way, if Gutenberg had printed the German tax code, he might not have been as successful as we know now. Now, for several centuries, essentially nothing happened. You had books, they were you know, expensive, nice, and diffused. Uh, but you had people like this. This is less than 100 years ago in Hungary. It's a town crier reading the newspaper to the town people. Amazing, right? Doesn't scale to internet scale, for sure. All right, in education, not much happened either. So people would teach on the blackboard like this, and I have followed classes like this, yes. Maybe I've even given some. Uh, and you know, this is not very efficient. A uh, college professor will maybe see 10,000 stu 10, students in a lifetime, that's about it. And um, you know, not much more would happen. One thing happened in the 20th century, it's a textbook, the invention of the idea that if you do this lecture a hundred times, maybe you write a book about it, and if a good, the book is good, it will actually have some impact. The next revolution is, of course, the digital revolution. And the digital revolution uh, is a world of computers, of networks, of multimedia, and so on. And uh, the quantum step, as far as the person in the street is concerned, was really the invention of the web, not far from here at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee, uh, about 20 years ago. And the other big step forward, of course, was the availability of mobile communication, smart terminals, smartphones, and so on, so you'd have information at your fingertips. Now, of course, when you see this, you wonder, the question to the jury, is this a Samsung phone or is it an Apple product? And the jury in America, of course, decided. All right, so the web had an influence, of course, on the way we would diffuse information. So quickly, people tried to use web technology to diffuse classes. I show two examples, MIT Open Courseware, where a lot of MIT courses were filmed, put on the web. There is a Swiss initiative from year 2000, Swiss Virtual Campus. Both were very nice, had limited impact, mostly because of acceptance of technology and the lack of feedback from students to actually give uh, information about how courses were going. So the real innovator, in my view, and uh, I'm, I'm a great admirer of this person, is actually a hedge fund manager, and I admire him more for what he did for education, I must say. It's Salman Khan, who used uh, technology that everybody has access to, YouTube, uh, Skype, and so on, and taught mathematics to his cousin over the internet. Six years on, he has delivered 150 million lectures over the internet, and that's quite a success. So the Khan Academy, created in 2006, uh, has about 3,000 lectures online on 10 different uh, subjects. It has little tests, so you can actually advance and test how well you master the material. Uh, the teacher can follow each student essentially individually if he or she chooses to do so. So this is the real innovation. Now, there was a big splash last fall, fall 2011, a uh, big splash in the US, all over the news and so on. What happened? Well, a bunch of Stanford professors essentially took the Khan model but scaled it up to internet scale, offering online courses uh, where hundreds of thousands of people signed up. There are several initiatives, some of them are for-profit, others are not for-profit. We list here both of them, and uh, future will say what will actually happen to these initiatives. There are many competing. I'm just going to quote the Stanford University professor John Hennessy, who said, well, something is happening that is transformative to education. There is a tsunami coming. I'll come back to this statement. 
All right. Now, how about EPFL? Right here, we decided to also play as a game. So we joined the Coursera Initiative. A colleague of mine, Martin Oderski, is teaching a class on Scala, which is a programming language he has invented here at EPFL. And the interesting thing is that within two weeks, he had more than 20,000 students signed up for the class. Just for calibration, the entire ETH system, Zurich and Lausanne together, have about 20,000 students. All right, so how does the classroom look like? It doesn't look like the blackboard we saw er earlier in the talk here. Uh, so on the left, you see a classical classroom, uh, which has you know, an interactive feeling to it. On the right, you see the recording studio, where we are going to you know, slave through these online courses. So that's a totally new experience for professors, I must say, as well as for students. OK, what's going to happen to textbooks? Textbook is a large industry. My view on the topic is that actually the online class, together with all sorts of uh, electronic additions, will be the new textbooks. So the textbook industry will have to reinvent itself, but you know that's, not, that's a good thing for them. All right, so last but not least, uh, let's conclude here on the tsunami of online education. My opinion is that this is going to transform the way we are going to learn, it's going to make education much more democratic, much more accessible across the world. And last but not least, that's of concern to us, is going to put pressure on campuses to actually do very good and relevant education. So in some sense, we are back to the Socratic method, and so the talk could have been entitled From Socrates to MOOCs and Back. Thank you very much.